Hello everyone and welcome back to another installment of Space News with me. Every Monday I give you a summary of the last seven days of activity from Starship development, launch events and all the other big news that I deem worthy of discussion. Today we have lots in store, from major Starlink updates, the imminent launch of NASA's monstrous moon rocket and much much more. Let's begin with Starship news. Last week kicked off with SpaceX crews hard at work on the orbital launch mount and the chopstick catch arms, all seemingly in preparation for the test campaign and eventual launch of Super Heavy Booster 7, which was still in the mega bay undergoing the installation of its 13 Raptor 2 engines. The hydraulic failure that the chopstick suffered a couple of weeks ago was fully repaired, and hardware to aid the catching of a Starship Super Heavy, including the catching pistons, continued to be installed on the arms. We got some full mobility testing of the system ahead of the Booster 7 rollout, so it was expected that SpaceX were planning on using the chopsticks to lift the booster into the orbital launch mount, rather than using a crane, which they needed to use last time they did a lift due to the aforementioned damage to the arms hydraulics. The very next day, on the 23rd of August, Booster 7 was rolled out of the Mega Bay as captured in these early hours photos by Starship Gazer. And upon reaching the launch site, our expectations were met as, yes, SpaceX are back to using the chopsticks to lift the boosters. Elon Musk tweeted this great drone shot of the lift taking place. I love it. I wish SpaceX would share more drone footage with us. They have a whole Flickr page that I'm sure could be filled with stuff if they wanted to. SpaceX, if you're watching this, then come on, the people need more pictures. On Wednesday, we were hoping to see a static fire of Ship 24, and indeed, it certainly looked like this was going to happen. The roads were closed, but then nothing. So seemingly a static fire abort here. We did then see SpaceX conduct a spin prime test of Ship 24 a little bit later on though, and then we also saw another successful spin prime test for Booster 7. All of this is hopefully a good indication that we'll see more static fires, hopefully within the next few days, from both the inner Raptors of Booster 7 and maybe all six on Ship 24. On the 25th of August, the chopsticks were raised in a way that damaged some of the scaffolding on the tower. You can just about see this in this clip from Lab Padre. Hopefully no damage was sustained to Stage 0 itself, and that this should all be fairly trivial to reinstall. We were treated to some brand new incredible footage of the Booster 7 and Ship 24 static fires from Cosmic Perspective. These shots are just incredible, but the best part of this video, in my opinion, is the sound. The sheer roar generated by the Raptor engine cannot be understated. Headphones are definitely a requirement for this video. Now, I'm not going to play the sound for you here though. Click that card on screen or via the link in the description to watch this one yourselves. I promise you, it's absolutely worth it. It was a shame that we didn't see any more static fire action from Ship 24 during Booster 7's stint in the Mega Bay, but this was almost certainly due to the fact that ground crews were busy making substantial upgrades to suborbital pad B. New flame diverters and a blast-resistant concrete pad have been installed, giving the pad a much more substantial foundation. It shouldn't be long now before we see a completed Ship 25. Over the past few weeks, we've seen various parts of this vehicle be transported for assembly in the high bay, including the nose cone and payload segments. Its downcomer was also recently installed as well. On the 27th of August, we celebrated the anniversary of Starhopper's flight. This was its final flight, where it used its single Raptor engine to reach a height of 150 meters and traveled to a landing pad nearby. The flight had followed two low-altitude tethered hops in April 2019 and one untethered flight to 25 meters. It's amazing to look at this video and appreciate just how much progress SpaceX have managed to make in the three years that followed this flight. And of course, Starhopper is still with us, now serving as a mounting point for communications, weather monitoring and tracking equipment, and of course, also acting as a water tank. Another big thing we saw at Starbase last week was a presentation from Elon Musk and T-Mobile CEO Mike Sievert. They announced a partnership between T-Mobile and SpaceX's Starlink. The presentation highlighted that despite all the advancements in wireless networks, well over half a million square miles of the United States and vast swathes of the ocean are completely isolated from mobile phone signals. Anyone venturing into these areas would need to carry an expensive satellite phone in order to contact anyone. But SpaceX and T-Mobile have a vision to allow regular mobile phones to connect directly to Starlink satellites, assuring the audience that the vast majority of smartphones already on T-Mobile's network would work without the need for any modification and without the need to purchase any extra equipment. By connecting directly to the Starlink satellites themselves, this service will essentially mean that customers can connect to cellular services in almost any location where they can see the sky. 
Initially, this will only include text messaging, though the companies do plan to allow voice and data coverage in the future. While on the subject of Starlink, SpaceX successfully launched their latest batch of satellites on Sunday. This was a shinier Falcon 9 than usual. This booster had only made one previous flight, supported the CRS-24 mission in December 2021, meaning it was a full 250 days between flights. Why so long? Well, it had a bit of a rough landing after the CRS-24 mission. Sean snapped some pictures of it looking very wonky on the drone ship as it arrived back to port. Those Merlin engines are certainly not looking very reflight ready. Luckily, it looks like all the repairs went well and the rocket put on a good show, deploying 54 Starlink satellites into Starlink Shell 4. This was the 24th launch to Starlink Shell 4 and SpaceX estimate 11 more will be required to complete the shell. The booster itself successfully landed on the drone ship a short fall of gravitas in the Atlantic Ocean shortly after stage separation. And with the landing of the booster, a new SpaceX record was set. This launch marked the heaviest payload launched to the low Earth orbit by Falcon 9, with the 54 satellites weighing in at around 16,700 kilograms, which is impressive considering that the booster can be reused. What a redemption arc for 1069 then. From botched landing to smashing records, here's hoping that 1069 continues to be nice. Over in China, on Tuesday, a Kwaizu 1A launched the Chuangxin 16 satellite from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. According to official Chinese sources, the satellite will mainly be used in scientific experiments, new technology verification, and other fields. So uh, yeah, a bit vague on that one really. But while we're on the subject of Chinese rocket launches, the next day, on Wednesday, a Long March 2D took to the skies from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried the Beijing 3B satellite, which is an Earth observation satellite with a 0.5 meter resolution, and according to official sources, it successfully entered its intended orbit and will mainly be used to provide remote sensing services in the fields of land resources management, agricultural resources survey, environment monitoring, and city applications. Last week, the James Webb Space Telescope released some amazing pictures of Jupiter. Look, I mean, this looks like it was taken by a satellite orbiting Jupiter, not something millions of miles away. These observations will give scientists even more clues to Jupiter's inner life. In this photo, you can see Jupiter's ring and its famous great red spot, a storm so big that it could swallow the Earth, which appears white in these photos, as do many of the other clouds, because they're reflecting quite a lot of sunlight. This annotated image shows what everything here is, so give this video a pause if you want to bask in these views for a little while longer. And hey, if you do that, don't forget to leave a like down below as well if you are enjoying the video. It really helps me out and I always do appreciate it. Now, it's all finally happening, like today, the launch of Artemis 1. Hopefully. So the timeline is that I'll publish this video around 7 o'clock universal time and then NASA will be launching the world's most powerful operational rocket less than six hours later. If all goes to plan and there are no delays, of course. So check me out. This news video could go out of date in under a day if all of this changes. I'm sure that's going to set some sort of speedrun record for videos going out of date. Haha! <laughs> but regardless, if you've been living under a rock, then the Artemis 1 mission is going to be huge. It'll be the first integrated flight test of NASA's deep space exploration systems, namely the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System rocket. The rocket will launch Orion on a trajectory towards the moon, and during its journey, the SLS will carry 10 small satellites that will perform their own science and technology investigations. The Orion spacecraft will become the furthest from Earth a spacecraft made to carry astronauts has ever flown, and it will also perform the fastest ever re-entry of a spacecraft built to carry people once it returns to Earth. This is going to be a mission of truly epic proportions. I can't wait to watch the live stream later today and see it all finally come together. And then I look forward to being the very last Space News YouTube channel to cover it. Man, sometimes Monday morning upload schedules can really screw me over a bit. <laughs> Anyway, I would now like to give a big thanks to all my Patreon and channel members. Their names are on screen right now, and it's their financial support of this channel that allows me to carry on making these videos just for you. If you want to join their magnificent ranks, you can do so by clicking the link in the description or via the link on screen. Uh, I'm working on lots of new content, guys. I'm trying to get a new Planet Coaster series on the on the go. And Kerbal, I'm, I'm working on a Kerbal video. I've, I know, it's been a while. I've got to sort it. There's video suggestions on screen as well. I think that's time. I haven't been timing myself, but I think that's how long my end screen is. 